Welcome to another episode of Harbor Rock Wealth Management's podcast series, Life, Health, and Wealth, where we discuss financially driven topics and how they relate to our financial lifestyles. He's Ruben Smith. I'm Jimmy Luster. And I'm going to take a breath before I introduce Jake Sampson here from Golden State Equipment, a new friend to me. It was a pleasure to meet you. We've had a little time to talk before mm-hmm. the show. Thanks for being here and making some time for us today. Welcome, Jake. Yeah, of course. Yeah, happy to have you, man. So what did I already dub you, the, the Wizard of Wastewater? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're, 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 these names you're coming up with for our guests. I I'm don't a know. big fan of alliteration. And it <laughs> yeah. uh, just makes me feel a little bit more comfortable, you know, uh, when I get a little excited. So again, thank you for being here. Looking forward to chatting with you. Um, so today, I, I usually give a stat of the day or a fun fact. I have a quote. It's Lee Trevino. Oh, OK. And it cool. really has nothing to do with what we're doing, except we might play a little <laughs> golf later. So yep. But it was, you don't know pressure until you're playing for five bucks when you only have two in your pocket. <laughs> oh, there you go. I thought that that go. seems like uh, standard Lee. I remember watching Lee Torino with my dad like when I was super young and not mm-hmm. really interested in golf at all. But, you know, it was like a, a Sunday, last day of the tournament. And I remember Lee Trevino being pretty, a pretty big character on uh, the course. Animated, yeah. A lot yeah. of fun to watch, so. That, that was a cool era in golf. You you had um, you think of Lee Trevino. You still had you saw Arnie and Jack playing. You had Chichi doing swinging his putter around. When he you know Chichi Rodriguez. Yeah, what that was a cool the first time. name that came to my mind too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was thinking about his putter dancing. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Maybe maybe we'll see one today if someone totally. drains a long putt. So. Well, what I'm happy about today is that I think the audience isn't going to hear as much from me as you for sure, and you you guys know each other. Uh, This is another one of those instances, and it doesn't happen every time, but I am definitely not the smartest person in the room here on this one, (laughs) and that takes a lot of pressure off me, so I'm really excited to learn more about what you do and and really how you're helping the community and the environment in what you do. Uh, Sounds, from what you've told me uh, already, pretty interesting, but you guys know each other, so I think think you guys kind of met on the pitch, as you guys like to call it the soccer field right? that's right yeah we um i i signed up uh, to be an assistant coach this year in in all of our my eight-year-old soccer team yeah uh, I, I prefer to take the the secondary role when it comes to coaching not to be the okay. in the spotlight so i didn't know jake uh i just i went for the name and he needs a he needs a spot so I, I signed up without him really knowing or having a say in it. So. You're like the goose to Maverick on the, on the, on the, as coaches go on the course? or Well, it's more like uh, if, you're, if there's any Ted Lasso fans, ah, okay. I, I'm more beard to Ted, to Ted over here. So, okay. Yeah, it's going to be. Cool. Uh, and, and how'd you guys do? You know, I thought we did okay. You guys went yeah. to the playoffs, right? It was really good. Yeah, yeah we did. Um, <clears throat> um, yeah, we ended up in the end of the season tournament. Lost a couple heartbreakers. It was a tough, tough, tough season how it ended. But you know what? what the cool thing about this this team is that there was friendships throughout that were made. Which a lot of times awesome. um, you kind of get these pods, right? These not clicks, but these little couple people that tend to tend to roll together. together. Yeah. But and I see it every day. I, I walk, um, I walk my daughters to school, and I see you know. I, everyone's saying hi to each other and doesn't matter if they're in a different grade or not. I mean, it, it was just a really cool feel for the, for the girls mm-hmm. this year. So. That should make you like, I bet his dad's like, it makes you so proud to like more see sportsmanship at that age and, and friendship and respect. Yeah. For, character development. Yeah. You know, when you're, you're, I played soccer um, at a, at a pretty decent level when we got a little bigger and stronger and faster and it, there's, there's contact. Man. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's, <laughs> Whether you like it or not, and I can see, I don't have any kids, but I've definitely seen some of those games under 10 years old, and there's a lot of concepts that are kind of hard to grab, and spacing, and you know, things of that nature that aren't natural to little kids. I mean, little kids seem to, ah, oh, I want to, you know, roll around <laughs> in a big group, and that's probably got to be one of your biggest things, is trying to, hey... I would say Stay 90% apart. of what we say from the sidelines. <laughs> yeah. Stay safe. Or- like we, had a, uh, we had a saying called, don't sink the ship, right? where you picture the entire field as a boat. And if everyone's standing on one side of the boat, it's going to tip over. Right. So I'm like, don't sink the ship means spread out, spread out. Yeah. Man. Because otherwise they want to play bumblebee ball where everyone just chases after the ball. Totally. We did our best, man. We yeah. did our best. And uh, we did have one game in particular against a team called, fittingly, the Bruisers, if you remember. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
every girl on our team had tears at one point. Oh in the no, game. it was that kind of game. So yeah, we yeah. life uh, experience learning life experiences on the on, yeah. on the field. We, we uh, we were able to learn some from that game. Yeah, yeah. everyone <laughs> took something away. So we, we did put the team picture up. Uh, Harbor Rock did sponsor the the team this year, so you probably can't see it, but it is in the back over here. Oh, that's awesome. Thought I'd represent. Um, we also got a couple other things in the studio. One I think oh. Jimmy should talk about, because as long as I've known Jimmy, he's been working for this piece of hardware right here. Um, you want to explain what this is? Sure. So um, fa- I play you fantasy sports. Go ahead and hold it. This is yours. I play fantasy sports. <laughs> And this is a really tough league. I mean, I've been in this league for uh, like a decade. And if anyone plays fantasy football, most people play fantasy football. Mm -hmm. And it can be as friendly as you want to make it with like standard scoring and, you know, everything. But baseball, fantasy baseball is all day. It's a grind. It's every day. There's multiple start times every day. The player universe is massive, you know, in the minor leagues. And and that pickup might win you the league. So I've come close before, and I've never won it, and I, I finally took it down this last year. So and I don't I don't think Christian's going to get this uh, this trophy <laughs> back. You're supposed to give it back every year to the whoever wins the championship again. I might just keep this and and replace it with something else. <laughs> uh, the, hey, the dynasty starts but, this year. Yeah. Anyway, well, you you definitely put in your time. I've known you for over ten years, and every year, every baseball season since we've known each other, he's been. I've heard about his fantasy team on a weekly basis. Oh, and yeah. I mean, so he finally got the hardware. So, so congrats, Jimmy. Oh, thank you. And I think the one who was most relieved was my wife. <laughs> she was like, I could see that. Thank yeah, God, sure. Jimmy took it down. Well, so don't anyway, have to hear about the drought anymore. Right, <laughs> right. Like, oh, I'll get him next year, you know. So anyway, so uh, environmental chemist. Mm-hmm. Do I have that correct? You have a chemistry background. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have a company that is looking out for our environment and our health, uh, mm-hmm. I should say. Tell us a little bit more about Golden State and how you how you came about. Um, so Golden State Equipment, um, we are kind of a three-pronged company. Um, we deal in environmental and industrial wastewater treatment systems. Um, we design them, build them, install them, um, and you know, offer long-term support for, you know, parts and process, um, you know, deal with, uh, government agencies who are, um, monitoring discharge specs for, you know, cleanliness. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we are, um, based out of Carlsbad, um, but we're a California state company. So we're kind of all over where we can be. Is that as common that you're, that companies are doing all three of, you know, these three facets or is it typically other, you know, you're working with a lot of companies are working with each other company to perform a task on these projects. Yeah, absolutely. So typically, you know, companies will do one or the other where they're just an engineering company who's, you know, hired to write a bid spec based off of a project and they send that out to other companies to bid. And then they're essentially, you know, either a general contractor who's buying and reselling the stuff that they're getting from, you know, an OEM who actually is building the equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, And those OEMs are typically buying the parts to integrate into their system from a manufacturer's representative who, you know, will either be representing a pump company, a valve company. Gotcha. Um, But I guess where we're a bit unique is... We are a manufacturer's rep for pump companies, valve companies. Um, we are the OEM. We uh, build the systems at our shop in Carlsbad. And we're also an engineering house who designs the processes, um, you know, for the clients. So it's really, uh, you know, an all under one roof set up. Kind of a least. one-stop shop, if you will. Now, I would guess that when you do that, it's, it's also cutting out um, if you're if you're dealing with one company, not only is it more convenient uh, and uh, from a communi- communication standpoint, uh, but I would guess if you're the consumer, the business that's that's needing this work done, that it's also eliminating some costs there too. If you're having oh yeah to work with three different companies versus one, it's so much more efficient of a process because yeah, like you said with just system responsibility, you know, you get six months down the road and you're running the equipment and, you know, something doesn't go according to plan. Yeah. 
and the customer calls their engineering company and the engineering company will say, you know, oh, it's because of the OEM who built the equipment, like they screwed up. Totally. And then you call them and they're like, oh, it was the, you know, the manufacturer's rep, you know, recommended the wrong parts to us. And so there's really no, there's a lot of different places to point fingers, but I guess for better or worse, I was going to say, all comes yeah. That could be bad too, right? What if you, I mean, not not bad, but it, it, it forces you to own your work and stand by yeah. your work because not yeah, only certainly. is there an issue anywhere along the process, it's there's no other fingers to blame. It's, you know, but it also, I, I would think, would build a long term relationship with these, with, uh, you know, these companies you're working with because you are building a relationship. It's all, you know, it's more of a consistent. Yeah. And actually, you know, because of that, you know, the vast majority of our work is, through repeat business because it's people that, um, you know, we've done projects with and, you know, they've got another project coming up and, you know, they saw that you stood by mm -hmm. even though there were problems. And also, you know, a lot of those problems are great opportunities to learn because if you figure out something that doesn't work in a process, like there's, there's no substitute for experience. Oh, yeah. and so That's if great. you've actually been in the field and say like, oh, you know, this particular part doesn't work in this process, then when you're selling it the next time to a new client, you can say, oh, here's what has happened to us in the past. And you know, mm. based on this direct experience that we've had. Right. Yeah. Well, it's like in, in our business, we can, we can, uh, we can pass all the exams to be fully licensed and, uh, to do anything from, you know, making funny hand signals on, on the floor of wall street or being right here in wealth management mm -hmm. or, you know, managing pension plans. Um, you know, there's a number of things you can do, but until you actually go out and do it, you really don't know what you're doing. Let's be honest. You, you can pass a test. You can do all this stuff. So a lot of that, that in-field learning, if you will, or, or uh, that experience is, is huge. And that's definitely shaped how I, how, how we run our business. Yeah. yeah. So I can't imagine you woke up at 12 or 13 years old and said, I'm going to be a chemist, you know, like, how did you how did you arrive into this industry? It was it a family affair? Um, did you kind of fall into it uh, by by chance? I mean, how did how did you get to where you are in, in what you're doing? Um, so it's interesting. I was uh, and this ties into a couple of things we talked about beforehand. Mm. Um, so I actually come from a family full of engineers. Um, and going into college, um, I played college baseball. Mm -hmm. And awesome. eventually transferred into the University of Washington, go Huskies. <laughs> um, yeah. And as a transfer into the University of Washington, um, I had a, an AA degree. And I applied to the um, mechanical engineering, the School of Mechanical Engineering at UW. But as a transfer student, they basically wanted me to retake two years worth of prereqs. Oh, wow. Um, and so, you know, I didn't want to stay in school for eight years mm -hmm. and yeah. not be a doctor. Right. <laughs> and so I kind of pivoted to a hard science um, and got into chemistry and, you know, kind of fell in love with the process of, um, and the company that I work for um, didn't used to deal as much in like the water treatment end of it, they actually used to subcontract that. And so when I was brought on, it was, um, you know, at a time that we were trying to expand that wing of the business. Gotcha. And now that's, you know, I would say primarily what I'm involved in is, you know, looking at these processes where, you know, you know what you need it to be at the end of the process. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, you know, the whole design is looking at what it, you know, what it is to start with and then designing your black box in the middle to make, you know, A go through B and end up at C. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know, I, I've always had a very like analytical way of thinking. And so that's, uh, that process is really interesting to me. Yeah. So let's, wow. let's talk about why, why Golden State exists. Is there governmental regulation? Um, I'm assuming so. I mean, it, these companies and these companies you work with, they obviously are in, in si some type of industrial business, mm -hmm. right? So they're producing a waste water uh, more more often than not, and I'm guessing they have to be under certain standards to be 
to stay in business. Yes. Right? Okay. So, so maybe elaborate on that. What what is your relationship with these with these companies? Um, and and like where do you, other than you guys being able to house it all or do everything in house? Um, where where's really that value? Okay. So there's really two parts of the business. One would be the industrial side, and one's the environmental side. On the industrial side, mostly what we deal with is um, water reclamation. Um, and it's, you know, we design a system to recover as much of the water in the process as we can, um, just so they're not using thousands and thousands of gallons of, you know, from the... I got you. Okay. Um, from, you know, that they have to pay for, first of all. So it's a big cost savings, but also from an environmental standpoint, you're minimizing the amount of water that's being needed for this process. Um, and so that one is not as much, you just need to clean the water enough so that you can use it again over and over and over in a closed loop. Um, but the environmental side, there's a lot more regulation and, um, you know, whether it be local governing bodies like Department of Ecology, Department of Natural Resources, depending on, or the EPA, depending on which, you know, field you're specifically in, mm -hmm. that part of it, um, you know, these governmental agencies will have specifications for, um, you know, how clean and, you know, what level of contamination your water can have as you discharge it off site, you know, be it to like um, a sewer or, you know, into groundwater. And so a lot of the systems that we do, we have um, like data loggers um, for compliance purposes. So, right. you know, if a company, um, you know, if they get audited and, you know, they have to prove that their the water they're discharging is below the spec, then, you know, our system will, you know, help them with their agency reporting. Um, and, you know, going back to the genesis of that, um, you know, if a company is just starting up and they have, um, a spec that they need to meet, they'll hire us to do a treatability study of their water um, that, you know, they submit to the agencies for approval. Gotcha. Um, so these audit, these audit processes, that's very much we're familiar with, uh, not necessarily the same business at all, but, but hmm. heavy, heavily regulated. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the business we are in is probably one of the most regulated businesses out there. I yeah. mean, literally every email we send is look at looked at any uh, trades we place for clients is looked at. We have to have notes on every interaction with a client. Mm -hmm. So uh, we understand that that piece of it completely. And actually, there's a lot of a lot of similarities there. Without that oversight and those regular documented audits, we would no longer allowed to be in business. So mm -hmm. um, we I don't think anyone really is is excited about getting audited. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, we realize that um, they are a partner, a vital partner of ours because they allow us to continue to do what we do, mm. you know, keep our doors open. Yeah. I liken it to like, a, and uh, in, in my industry, I came from the banking side of wealth management when Ruben and I were working together at our previous firm and client security cybersecurity, mm. security of information is key. You can have the best banking products, the best investment products, the best people, all the branches, all of the ATMs, all of the conveniences, but if you can't protect your client's information, you're no good, mm. right? So I kind of liken it to that uh, of doing your preventive maintenance to avoid catastrophe, you know, mm. uh, or a disaster. And, what, and that, what that would look like on our end um, until they got their head around it was I wake up and log into my account. There's no money in there anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're like, what just happened? And pretty quickly, you know, our industry got their head around it. Like, well, who does it best? Well, let's go hire the people from NASA and all these, these organizations to build our platform and we'll advertise that. Mm -hmm. And I saw that as an, as a, a, a responsibility, you mm -hmm. know, when I was working yeah. there to do that. I was very proud of the company that I was working for, for doing that. And everyone followed suit, you know, and then the criminals got ahead of the game and, you know, they'd figure something out. It was like a chess match going back and forth. But, uh, you know, it's all about exper client experience and how that affected. It ripples out so far, the impact. 
So when I think of what you're doing, I read some stat that Americans uh, in the United States, we use like 34 billion gallons of water a day. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't even know what that looks like. You know, (laughs) I'm sure you can kind of, hmm, that would probably fill up uh, uh, the small, you know, I don't know what that looks like. And that's where it ends for me, though. The impact, <laughs> the, the impact piece. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's for, a good point. And, and, and uh, I know you weren't going to hear from me as much today, but I, I just thought of this, too. And it helps me kind of understand what you do more on, on a process scale of going to the dentist. And they say, brush and floss, right? Mm-hmm. And not just every once in a while, every day and twice a day and all these things. And what I don't really realize is not just my breath or, you know, general in my mouth health, but my heart and the rest of my body and all these things. Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit about the impact on what you do at that level, not just keeping these people in business or, or being ethical or, you know, doing things the right way, but how, how far does that ripple out in the impact? Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little explanation of, of sure. what you do and how it might affect my daily life. Sure. You know? So what's good is I feel like a lot of these regulations breed innovation in different ways to like a, just monitor for, you know, potential contaminants and whatever. But, um, yeah, from a, a safety standpoint, um, you know, being able to, um, hold companies avail- accountable for pollutants that they're introducing into the environment, um, is, you know, primary, um, of as far as the way that it would interact with, you know, the average person. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, having ways to monitor and hold these people accountable. Um, and then, you know, not even just with water, but also, you know, a lot of our clients work in mining, which creates a lot of dust. Oh yeah. Um, and you know, beyond just making your car dirty, you know, breathing in silica dust is not good for you. Yeah, um, sure. And so, you know, finding innovative ways to, you know, both figure out how much dust you're creating, you know, finding ways to abate it during the process and just, you know, promotes general health as for not just the people that are around there, but the people that are actually like working there. And Right, right. Um, yeah. That dust is funny because I, I remember seeing, uh, I used to, at two firms ago, I, I worked for a hospital. I managed their <clears throat> retirement plan out in Palm Desert, and they were doing a, a massive uh, construction project. And I remember seeing on the fences around the uh, construction project, if you see dust coming from this project, oh, call us ASAP. I've seen those signs before. Yeah. Mm. And I, I remember thinking of it as, ah. Okay. That's nice. That's yeah, nice. Right. Yeah, no one wants a dusty. Oh, my car is going to get dusty. But I did, I, yeah, I guess I guess I'm just putting two to two together here that, yeah, you don't want to breathe that. You don't want it to be a constant, especially there's a lot of houses and things around. So. Right. Wow. So it's not just. Yeah, so specifically yeah. with silica sand, which is mostly what's being mined for, um, you know, it's used in to make glass, um, solar panels. Um, so silica sand is on like a molecular level, it's very sharp. So when you breathe it in, it like, um, will actually like stay in your lungs and makes it so that, you know, when you breathe, the goal is to like get oxygen to your mm-hmm. blood and it makes your lungs less efficient because it basically like gets lodged in and kills certain spots, wow. uh, like receptors where oxygen gets passed to the blood. So it like reduces the body's ability to oxygenate your blood. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, uh, dust prevention has been a big thing. I'll have to ask you more about that uh, off outside of the show because I, I, as a hobby, I do woodworking and, um, I, I'm pretty safe now. Um, but there was a point there in the beginning where I wasn't. So let's, let's talk about what I'm up against. (laughs) So like how personal do you take this work? I mean, when, when you see a a news article on TV, let's, let's say I see something regarding wastewater, someone has broken the law or, you know, someone's being investigated. Obviously I'm sitting there with my wife watching the news at night or something. I'm like, "Ah, that's terrible. Yeah. mm, Yeah. That's no good. What do you feel when you see something like that? Are you like, you know what? (sighs) 
that's ridiculous. We need to come up. Is your mind already working? Like when you, that, that sounds like a project we worked on or. Just, yeah. I mean, it is an opportunity, but I guess I don't necessarily think of it that way. I more think of it as, you know, typically these processes that are creating pollution are you know, vital for, um, you know, everything that's produced in this country. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah, there's through, gonna be a waste component and, in everything we do, right? I mean, yeah, I can't and, avoid that. And so, yeah, I guess it's it's more. I start to think about, um, you know, how can this process be better? How can this be more efficient? And, you know, going back to learning from failure, it's like, okay, why did what they're doing used to work and not work now? Is it because of a failure in regulation? Is it because of a failure of a piece of equipment? Um, so I guess that's how I would think about it. Is like, trying to think why yeah. or how they got to where they are. And then more importantly, I guess, would be what could they have done differently and what can they do differently going into the future to avoid this? And then kind of piggybacking off of that, um, you know, a lot of companies who would find themselves in that situation um, where you have to spend a lot of money to treat your waste. And you know, <clears throat> as a company and a business owner, you know that whatever money you put into that, you're not getting anything back. Like it's it's not going to make you any more product. Mm. Um, yep. And so, it's interesting seeing companies, um, you know, from an accountability standpoint, saying like, you know, hey, we're going to make this investment and use it for, you know, some positive PR, especially if it's at a time when they need it. If there is an incident that led to them having to do it. Um, well, that's a good, that's an interesting point. In the investment world, we're, we're hearing a lot about ESG investing and mm. uh, maybe um, more environmentally focused or socially aware investments. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think that's important. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very much the minority of, of the funds out there anymore. It's becoming a measurable. So through a few of our, our analytic tools that we use in companies, uh, we can see with each investment, they're rating from an ESG standpoint. So if a client inquires and that's a main focus, we can see if it'll be a fit for what they're looking for mm -hmm. in a portfolio. But I, I, I agree with you. you. You're hearing a lot about uh, companies being carbon neutral. And so what does that, what does that, what does that mean? Does that mean that let's say they're not necessarily in an in industrial business. Let, let's say they're a financial institution. Does carbon neutral meaning that they are going to plant trees in lieu of all the paper that they that mm -hmm. they use, or what, or the travel. I mean, I, I guess yeah, I don't. Less know, of a footprint. I guess or... I don't really understand what that entails from a company that's not actually in in manufacturing. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a moving target too. And okay. It's, um, you know, I guess one way I think about it is. Um, you know, there's things that your average citizen can do in their everyday life to reduce the amount of carbon, but mm -hmm. that's being put into the atmosphere. But, you know, it's such a you know drop in the bucket, so to speak, compared to a lot of the, you know, um, larger polluters, mostly being industry. Right. And okay. so I guess, uh, I don't know, I try to think of ways to you know, deal with the, the, you know, if you are able to sort out one polluter, that's a giant corporation, you know, that's the same as like, you know, recycling for, you know, a million people or whatever for a year. <laughs> right. Let's yeah. put this into perspective. So it has no, a bit of a larger things, yeah, impact. I can't get my head around that. Yeah. It's also, I mean, that's looking crazy. at a company, let's say there is a company out there that gets, that gets pointed out, they get caught, right? Mm. Now there's bad press. Now you're looking at from a corporate standpoint, you have shareholders, you have stock value, you have I mean, I, I, that's why I, I asked you, is it, um, why I think it's interesting you brought it up, is it, is it kind of cliche to be carbon neutral? You know, is it, is it yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. popular? You know? yeah, and, I, and I hope the best, their, their best intentions are there, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's, but, ki it's kind of like, a, like a, a snack bag of something saying organic, <laughs> you know? And, and it's like, that's a marketing piece. Like, we can say, we're organic and gluten-free and... Or, or like, well, yeah, you're a corn chip, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, I'm of just course gonna say you that. are. Yeah, yeah, It'd exactly. be weird if you weren't. Yeah, <laughs> why would you be uh, not gluten-free, you know? It's, uh, 
I don't know. My favorite chips, uh, El Napolito, oh, on the there. <laughs> and I love them, but it says gluten free on them, and I always laugh at it when yeah. I see it. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> right, right on. Water. It's wet. Yeah. Oh, it is. So it contains water. Yeah. It, this <laughs> ingredient, water. Yeah. So I wonder if like uh, it'd probably be awesome if everyone was following the rules and mm. everyone put a nice chunk of resource into uh, not not. You know, trying to put you out of business, of course, but it seems like it's good. It it would almost be good for a company every once in a while to get checked, like publicly. Yeah, almost. It seems like, you know, and 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 not doing something horrible where we have like a big issue, a pollutant issue or something, but almost coming out like, hey, we had to, uh, we want to bring these people, ABC company to light. You know, we had to update what they were doing, you know, mm-hmm. and now nine other companies see that and they're going in and checking themselves you know it seems like it might have a a step back for a major step forward sometimes you know in, in what you're doing um i don't know i just thought of that concept i, I don't know how often that i think that happens anyways just in based off of people whether or, they're getting you know, pointed out for something negative or positive yeah. i mean everyone's trying to at the end of the day keep their keep their business open and, and running and being efficient where i where i think uh, golden state is different is that um is that you're you're truly building a partnership with these companies and and it's yeah. and it's clear because of your your repeat business mm-hmm. right you wouldn't have people coming back to you where it, it wasn't a clean process and it didn't save them uh headache and and money and mm-hmm. time right we talked about time the other day on a, a as a commodity on mm-hmm. a, a podcast and uh as as we are business owners time is huge right mm-hmm. Um, and it likens it. It, I, I, it reminds me of we bought. Uh, we've purchased solar on our house mm. twice or, or two different houses, mm. and the company that we went with wasn't necessarily the cheapest. They were the most transparent uh, as far as telling me what I needed um, mm. and telling me what was out there as far as this year's top of the line technology versus maybe last year's and they were really flexible and honest with uh, as far as pricing goes so they were they were working with us but what the the thing i liked about them the most and i like about them the most is the service standpoint Mm -hmm. they will continue to service that and they they email me when maybe something's off in in one of the the Mm -hmm. meters or so it's um it's it and i and i feel like that's part of that's an element of that is in your business because if you're not only building a system, right? Someone came in and designed a system for my solar right on the house, but now you're monitoring and you're there to to implement any changes or or adjustments that's needed. To me, that seems like a yeah a good experience from a business standpoint. Yeah, and ultimately, you know, people buy from people, and right? And so that trust element, you know, that's I guess ninety percent of what the initial process is when we're meeting with a client is establishing trust. And a lot of that is, you know, comes from having field experience where, you know, you can say, Oh, I wouldn't do it that way because, you know, I was on this job and, you know, this happened and, you know, it it buys you some credibility where they know like, Oh, this isn't just some guy who's trying to sell me the system he has on the shelf. Mm, It's uh, you know, someone who's actually interested in, coming up with a unique solution for my specific process and, you know, working with them to the point where, you know, six months after you've installed the equipment, like, you know, some OEMs who would just build a system, sell it to you. And like, as soon as the check clears, they don't answer your calls anymore. Right. They're on to the next project or sale or whatever it is, transaction. Yeah. And so a big part of our business is, you know, ongoing um, support and that's through, you know, our, our wing of being a manufacturer's representative where we represent the equipment that's installed is, you know, if there's ever a problem with that, you know, they call us or even just ongoing parts and maintenance support for, you know, stuff that is like a wear item that, you know, needs to be periodically replaced. But what's nice about having that is it keeps us in long-term contact with our customers and with these systems. And, um, it's a very tight knit industry to where, you know, one guy who gets promoted at one plant Mm -hmm. and, you know, 
goes to work for one of their competitors, you know, as a promotion, and maybe he remembers, oh, you know, five years ago, we put in this system with Golden State Equipment, and, you know, they really supported it. So, <clears throat> you know, if we're going to do this plant expansion, we should bring them in awesome. to look at the process. Right. And so that's, you know, why having that ongoing support is such a big part of, um, you know, our customer interactions and relations. So I'll, I'll, I'll relate this to our to how we run our business or our objective is to we see we see our clients um, as uh, we we see ourselves as being in partnership with our clients. Mm. Right. So without our clients, we wouldn't be here. Yeah. Right. Um, and for that reason, we feel we owe it to them to be transparent uh, about where we're at from a business standpoint um, and, and also transparent in the, in the sense of who we are as people. And I think, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say it's a lot, you know, that's lost in, in mm -hmm. business today, but I think it's, it's a way to be a differentiator for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And owning our work. Absolutely. You know, uh, absolutely. And showing that, that we're human too, you know, right. and, and Hey, we, we designed a, let's say it's a pump or we, we designed a system for you and it failed. We own and we understand why that failed. We own it, and now we're going to fix it in partnership, as opposed to pointing pointing a finger, pu pushing the blame elsewhere. So kudos to you, man. Yeah. yeah that's, I'm, I'm, oh yeah. Please go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say yeah. that's such an important thing for, um, you know, I guess just for me personally in business in general is like ownership of mistakes. Like you know, obviously I've I've made a bunch sure. in my career. We all have. Yeah. And you know, it's. Those one, are the big moments. One thing I always say yeah. when I'm talking to customers and there is a problem is like, you know, let's not focus on what happened to get us to this point. Like, let's focus on what we can do moving forward to. And I think that's a good way to turn the page and take ownership of the project or, you know, of the particular problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times it's something that, you know, we have to fix and, you know, really, it's just the end result of they're happy with what they have. That is all that matters. So I see that as a, as an opportunity. So we've all had uh, moments in our careers where, it's like, man, okay, I missed that. I understood there was a mistake, and it fell on our shoulders. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I see that as as an opportunity, or a, uh, one of my friends used to say, as an at bat. That's a that's a chance to mm -hmm. to go back and and recalibrate, if you will, and and figure out. Are we going baseball analogies? A little bit. A little right. bit. Okay, now I'm ready to talk. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Well, we've got two <laughs> baseball players here, so yeah. Um, no, it's kind of funny because yeah. you get four at-bats, five at-bats a game. You don't you don't look at what happened the previous at-bats. You know, you it's a new at-bat. Well, new, the good ones. Pitch by pitch. And, I'll put it this way. The, the good ones don't. <laughs> you try not to let it. Wait, what's it called when you, when you strike out four times in a game? Golden sombrero. There you go. Yeah. So if you're on three yeah. and you're up for that fourth time, are you? <laughs> no, I'm gonna. No, I'm looking to do damage. You on forgot pitch. about those yeah. first three? Okay. Well, so, that's why you were. You made it. That's to That's why the I'm level. here today. That's you why know? you made it to the level you did. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of. My mind's always. I love these sit downs because I meet someone that I, I. I really don't know a lot about what you do, and I'm learning. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm interested. Um, but conceptually, I, I'm like my mind's always turning and trying to get in your shoes on what a day might look like or like the fulfillment you might get from the work or relate it to some other facet of industry that is doing important work. And so I shared with you, I have a, I have a broken bone in my knee mm -hmm. and I found out when I was 36, 37, I'm now 45, uh, that really my option is to get a knee replacement. And, uh, the doc said, don't do that right now. If you can, if it's not too painful, you only know your pain. You know, but if you can deal, wait as long as you can. Processes will get better. The technology is going to get better, more innovative, um, less uh, uh, le less of a impactful to your health and your daily living. You know, if you can wait. So I'm kind of liking it to some of that work that you're doing. It, you see, it seems to be all about innovation and process. It's something that's inevitable. We're all there. Are always going to be illnesses mm -hmm. that happen. There's always going to be a, a breakdown of the body. Uh, there's going to be people that need prosthetics. I'm thinking of people that continue. Think of like how far that's come in people that need a, a leg or an arm or a hand, you know, or mm -hmm. to, to have a better life. 
you're almost doing hero work, in my opinion, of probably how far that impacts us on our daily lives and our health and our future and future generations and further than I can even imagine. I'll be long gone from this earth and the work and the processes that you're doing are going to be so impactful to the health of my family a hundred years from now, 200 years from now. And those processes, Mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's huge. Talk about waking up and being fulfilled by what you're doing. Well, we did a lot of, you know, you think about, um, the infancy of America, the industrial revolution and all that. I mean, we did a lot of damage, you know, we did, and that's just here in the United States. And there's still some countries out there that we won't name any that are pretty heavy polluters. You know, they haven't. And, uh, you know, it, it, Everyone has their opinion on global warning, global warming, but um, sure. I don't know. I I know that it's uh, it's going to be pushing pushing seventy degrees here in San Clemente, <laughs> and I believe a, about a week ago it was hotter than any day that we had this summer, and we're in November. So I know, interesting. Topic. I don't know. I'd say something's changed. <laughs> yeah. Well, what's interesting that makes me think of is one of my first major projects I worked on. Um, this was probably 2008, 2009, okay. um, up um, near Redding, California, mm, okay. um, you know, home of the gold rush. And there was a, a mine from that started in the 1850s. Mm-hmm. And like, as you can imagine, like the process of leaching gold from the ore was pretty primitive. And like, you know, how fast can we do this? And they would just, you know, all of that, um, material that they used went into um, a reservoir and that reservoir had the the lowest occurring pH in North America. So it was an EPA Superfund site, Mm. which is something that the EPA, um, you know, puts a fence around and they're like, this is polluted. It needs to be fixed. And so we were part of that process of cleaning up the, the water. And because the water in this reservoir, um, anything that ran down into it, and hit that low pH water, it was ionizing metal contaminants like lead, copper, arsenic, zinc that would go into the um, Sacramento River, which feeds 80% of the drinking water in the bay. Wow. And so like that process was, you know, we dredged out the reservoir, which is basically like a underwater vacuum cleaner. Okay. And treated all of this stuff in like a lined pond to catch all the contaminants and then return the water, you know, that doesn't have the, the metal contamination in it anymore. How long does something like that take? Uh, that one was two years. I was going to say, <laughs> that's just, and, well, and once the equipment's in place, it's just constantly filtering the water. It's yeah. on, you turn it on and it's going. Unreal. There were two three month phases. Okay. And so okay. they did it for three months and then like reevaluated everything and decided what needed to be done and then did another three months the next spring. So you found room for error, like found, found where you could improve, right? Yeah. It, yeah. There you go. I love it. Yeah. And so it's just interesting going back to what Jimmy was saying, like how the processes have evolved over time. And, you know, again, back in the 1850s, they probably didn't know that what they were doing would be harmful, you know, a hundred years into the future. Well, they were smoking, just focused on, you know, think about the ads of doctors smoking, you know, representing Marlboro or Pall Mall or, you yeah. know, back in the day. Mm. The, the, Surgeon know. General warning came out in the sixties, I think the, for the first time. Right. So, yeah, yeah crazy. I mean, uh, wow. Well, I appreciate your work. I mean, this is, yes. this is something that I think, um, the general population doesn't have a, a deep grasp on. I certainly know I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear about it in media or news and think, wow, yeah, I have an opinion and I wish, you know, maybe there wasn't a spill or there wasn't contamination here or there. Um, but I think it's important to that we're in front of this and why not use our platform to, to um, you know, let, let the world know, whoever ends up watching this, what, what good work Golden State Equipment does. So thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for doing the work you do. Uh, And as I told you before, this time flies. So we're coming up on wrapping today. And I'm sure this won't be the last time we have you on the show. Uh, We'd love to have you back. And I'm I'm sure there's going to be, you know, new things that come out in your industry that we might be interested in to hear about and some progressions in the processes and how they're affecting our daily lives. So we call this our digital barbershop. So thanks for joining us (laughs) in the digital barbershop. uh, And we look forward to seeing you again soon.
Okay. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Yeah. Absolutely, man. And to our viewers, if you're living your life and you have your health, you're the wealthiest person in the world. We'll see you again soon. Thank you.